evening and welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, for this series. And uh, today, we're going to talk about phosphorus. It's kind of an important element for us here. Um, I'm going to be followed by a second speaker, Julia De Marinas, and she is going to talk about, um, well, she's a, let me talk, tell you about her. She's an astrobiologist and a science instructor at the Chabot Space and Science Center. I hope everybody here has had a chance to go to the Chabot Space and Science Center over in Oakland. Great place. Go there for an evening. You get to look through telescopes. They have a great planetarium and a, and a really nice museum. Absolutely go there. It's a wonderful place. Um, her research consists of building and testing instrumentation for remote biosignature detection. Remote biosignature detection. Uh, using spectroscopy uh, at NASA Langley. She previously worked at NASA Ames, just down the uh, peninsula here, and at the Denver Museum of Na Nature and Science. Um, so let's get started on phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus is a really uh, a very interesting element, um, and we'll see why. Uh, it's uh, found in the periodic table sort of in that well, third row down there, uh, its uh, chemical symbol is P, so it's a really nice, simple one. Uh, phosphorus is element number 15. It's, uh, it has 15 protons in its nucleus and a variable number of, uh, of uh, uh, neutrons in there as well. We'll get to that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, phosphorus was actually the 13th element to be discovered. Uh, and it's uh, also because of this and its use in explosives and poisons and nerve agents, it's sometimes referred to as the devil's element. Uh, it was the first element to be discovered that was not known since ancient times. So it's got an interesting history to it. Now in the periodic table, phosphorus, as you can see, is, a, is a, in that column in the red. It's the second one down right there. It's uh, in the nitrogen group. It's also, I, th I have to tell you this because I didn't know this myself, but it's, uh, that group is also called the nictogens with the silent P, and that just makes it too cool to not tell you about <laughs> the nictogens. So phosphorus does share some, uh, some features, uh, some chemical features with the other elements in that column with nitrogen, and later on we'll be talking about arsenic and uh, antimony and bismuth and MC, which is a new element for us, when, uh, which we talked about a couple of months ago. So phosphorus, the word phosphorus is a Greek word. There it is in Greek. And uh, if you read Greek, it says phosphorus. Uh, and that actually, if you take that word apart, comes from light bearer. If you translate it, it means light bearer. Because if you have a, a sample of phosphorus in air, it seems to glow in the air. It also is a name for the planet Venus, which is also a very bright planet in the sky. So that glowing was originally called phosphorescence, but phosphorescence is actually something different. The glowing of phosphorus uh, is uh, something different. Phosphorescence is the stuff that we're used to, this glow-in-the-dark material. Uh, maybe we can turn the lights down and I can show you phosphorescent material. This is phosphorescent material right here. You may recognize this because we have it just around the corner in the shadow box. And when you expose phosphorescent material to light, which I will with a flashlight light here, it glows in the dark. So this phosphorescence is a glow in the dark phenomenon. It is a um, phenomenon that's due to really the structure of the atom and being able to excite this material with the light and the atoms here actually get kind of stuck with the energy until they eventually give it up. That is, uh, again, phosphorescence, but the glowing that you see in uh, phosphorus, in the white phosphorus, is actually not phosphorescence, it's chemoluminescence. It's actually the combining of that phosphorus with oxygen in the air and then that gives off light. So let's take a look at the um, uh, by the way, this phosphorescent material, this green stuff, is actually has no phosphorus in it at all. These are things like zinc sulfide and uh, strontium aluminate. That's what this is. So no phosphorus in this. We're going to do a lot of not phosphorus in things tonight as well. It was first discovered by this fellow Hennig um, Brand in 1669. And uh, this is a painting of him. Uh, discovering phosphorus. Uh, the painting is called The Alchemist in Search of the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, he never did discover any way to turn any element into gold, um, nor did he discover the Philosopher's Stone. 
I guess I had to wait for Harry Potter. But uh, here he is, and this is kind of exaggerated. The glow here is somewhat exaggerated. Well, it's grossly exaggerated, actually. But uh, kind of a nice painting here. Uh, he uh, discovered phosphorus, and he uh, refined it with urine. There's a lot of phosphorus in urine, it turns out. And uh, his method looked something like this. By the way, he first felt that he had to allow the urine to spoil first. This is not, a, this is not a, something you want to do at home, or anywhere for that matter. So boil the urine until it, and reduce it into a thick syrup. And then you heat that until a red oil distills up from it, and you draw the oil off. The remainder, you allow it to cool, and it's two parts. It's a black kind of crust, spongy stuff, and a salty lower part. You discard, discard the salt, and you mix the red oil back into it. You heat that mixture strongly for 16 hours. This is a long process. Um, the white fumes come off, uh, and then oil, and then phosphorus. And you take those fumes, and you, you, you pass the fumes through water. And then the water, in the water, the phosphorus condenses. It does not react with the water. And you get this waxy substance in the water. Um, so that is how to make phosphorus. So I'm sure you're all going to go home now and give this a try. Just remember that it does take about uh, 200 liters of urine to make about 60 grams of phosphorus. So start collecting tonight. Go ahead and drink, have some more drinks. Go out and get another beer and start your, your, your phosphorus collection tonight. Now, Robert Boyle, he, he also purified uh, phosphorus in, eight, in 1680, a few years later. But he was the first to use phosphorus to make these things, these make matches. So uh, he uh, uh, actually had an application for it. Now, boiling urine is not a really good way, well, pleasant way to make phosphorus. These two guys here, um, Johann Gottlieb Gahn and Carl Wilhelm Scheele, uh, show that bones contain phosphorus. And uh, they uh, obtained elemental phosphorus. They were able to refone it from bone ash, burnt up bone. Uh, and Lavoisier, uh, uh, he recognized, he was the first guy to recognize phosphorus as an element, as, a, in, as an individual element. He did that in uh, 1777. So the bone ash and urine process kind of gave way eventually to using phosphate rocks, which we'll see in just a bit. Uh, but that took a little while technologically until 1890 to perfect because you had to heat them up very, very hot in a furnace. So where does phosphorus come from? Phosphorus is made in very, very large stars. And uh, I think Julie is going to tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, if we look at phosphorus, uh, it is uh, the 19th most abundant element in the universe. So it's not, it's pretty abundant. Um, it's a only 0.0007% of the universe, but it's still the 19th most abundant element because mainly hydrogen and helium is most of the universe. Um, if you look at the sun, not surprisingly, it's about the 19th most abundant element in the sun since the sun is made out of mostly stuff from the universe. In meteorites, you go up a little bit, it's the 15th most abundant thing in meteorites. And let's move a little bit into the crust of the Earth. It's the 13th most abundant thing in the crust of the Earth. And in the oceans, you kind of drop down again because, again, most of the phosphorus is tied up in rocks, so it's not dissolved in the ocean. So it actually is the 19th most abundant thing in the ocean. But in human beings, in human beings, it's the sixth most abundant element. It's very important. It's 1.1% of you. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So phosphorus comes in different forms. You can put, if you have just elemental phosphorus, you can put the atoms together in different ways. Uh, and those different ways are called allotropes. Now, if you remember, how many people were here for carbon? Nobody. Okay, we're going to talk about it again then. Carbon, you could put carbon atoms, just carbon atoms together into lots of different forms. Here, uh, you can see it's in the form of uh, a diamond. You can see kind of a tetrahedral structure. If they're sheets, you have graphite. You can put them together into this big 60 carbon atom ball that's called Buckminster Fullerene because it's like a Buckminster Fuller dome. And those look very different. So a diamond looks very different from graphite. And this is actually buckyballs uh, dissolved in a, in a solvent. So there's, there's really buckyballs in there. Likewise, phosphorus also has different ways to put the atoms together. So they're allotropes. The same, the same element, but put together differently uh, uh, in phosphorus. If you put them together in a tetrahedron, like over here, you get white phosphorus. 
actually it's almost clear, you can see there. White phosphorus, you have to be careful with it. It's very, very flammable, explosive. And uh, if you expose it to light, it turns yellow. So this is a very pure sample that you see here. Um, if you just combine the tetrahedrons together, you get red phosphorus. And if you have a sheet-like structure, sort of like graphite, um, you get black phosphorus. It kind of looks like white phosphorus, but this is actually chunky black stuff. There's also another form of phosphorus called violet phosphorus, but it's very, very rare, um, kind of hard to make. Actually, here's a chart that shows you how to make one from the other. You can take white phosphorus and heat it and get red phosphorus. You can heat it for a couple of weeks and get violet phosphorus. Or you can take white phosphorus and put it under 12,000 atmospheres and get black phosphorus. So that's a little hard to make, not a home project. Now, allotropes are all the same kind of atom, but isotopes ha are really the same number of protons in the nucleus, but different numbers of neutrons. So there are 15 protons, and so for instance, phosphorus 30 has 15 protons and 15 neutrons. That's phosphorus 30. And these are all the isotopes of phosphorus. If you treated these things chemically, they would all act identically. However, not all of these exist in nature. As a matter of fact, phosphorus only, phosphorus 31 exists in nature. There's only one stable isotope. Phosphorus 30, 30 they're all, all the others are radioactive and most of them have very, very short half-lives. So they are gone pretty quick. Uh, phosphorus 33 uh, has a half-life of two days and phosphorus 32 has a half-life of 14 days. So. Uh, but phosphorus 31 being the only one that is stable makes up 100% of all the phosphorus in the earth and probably pretty much in the universe too. Uh, I was talking a little bit about density here. Phosphorus has uh, a density that's just really about double that of water almost. Water is at one gram per cubic centimeter. Phosphorus is a 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter. And you can see down there there's a bunch of other stuff too. Um, Tungsten, which is this block right here, is 19 grams per cubic centimeter. That's it's almost exactly the same density as gold. So if you want to know what a gold brick feels like, come up and lift that up. I could not get an osmium brick. Sorry. Um, phosphorus, but it melts at uh, about 44 degrees centigrade. So it melts at a very low temperature. Um, uncomfortable for you, but uh, it just just above uncomfortable for you. It melts. Uh, white phosphorus. Uh, and it boils at about 280 degrees. So density wise, let's take a look at, here's a chart with density. So this is higher density and lower density and this is the order of the, uh, uh, scare the, uh, order of the elements by density. So here's the tungsten and lead and iron, copper, aluminum, really less, not very dense, magnesium, very, very light, and phosphorus, way down there. So phosphorus has about the same density as this magnesium block here. So if you want to feel phosphorus, I don't have any samples of elemental phosphorus here. This is about the right density. This has a density of 1.7, so pretty close to 1.8. Uh, the atom of phosphorus kind of looks like this. On the outside, there are five electrons. Um, and so uh, it's a little bit different than silicon, which had four electrons on the outside. There's an extra electron, which does become important later on. It's because of those, uh, those extra electrons on the outside, phosphorus is a little bit bigger than hydrogen, just to give you a, an idea. Uh, 110 picometers versus about 53 picometers for hydrogen. A picometer is what? It's a million, uh, it's a thousandth of a billionth of a meter. So it's very small. Atoms are small. Um, if you took the spectrum of, this is the, here's the periodic table of the spectra. If you look at the spectrum of phosphorus, it's actually not too remarkable. There's no bright lines like we see with mercury and hydrogen and other elements, sodium like that. But so it has a, an interesting complex spectrum, but uh, not, no elements of, uh, no lines, colors of real interest. So where do you get, where do you get phosphorus from? Well, we mentioned that it's part of urine, but it's also part of other things that you might excrete, or birds for that matter. So here, uh, you can also mine guano, and guano is a really great source of, uh, of uh, phosphorus, but that's an extremely limited resource. Uh, that's probably all gone by now. And uh, you also 
can get it out of rock, out of phosphate rocks. Um, phosphorus as an element does not occur naturally in nature. It's always combined with something, usually in the form of some kind of phosphate. Phosphate is a phosphorus atom and four oxygen atoms. So um, here, this is an island in the Pacific Ocean, uh, Nauru, and they're mining uh, uh, phosphate rocks here. That rock is in the form of this, uh, apatite crystals, calcium phosphate, usually with a, either a, a OH, a hydroxyl, or a fluorine, or a chlorine, one of these things uh, attached to the calcium phosphate. You get different forms of the mineral. So how do you get phosphorus out of this rock? It's actually a pretty difficult process. You have to heat it up a lot. And I'm gonna, okay, I apologize for this. Chemical formulas, just, you can nod off for just a slide or two here. I just wanna show you the formulas, okay? So we have calcium phosphate, and you take calcium phosphate and you mix it into sand, silicon dioxide, that's just sand, and you heat it up really hot, and the silicon on the sand combines with the calcium over here, and that gives you calcium silicate, and this is phosphorus pentoxide. Now that is used down here in the next one. You start off with phosphorus pentoxide, you mix it up with a bunch of charcoal, heat it up really hot, and you get native phosphorus and carbon monoxide out. So that's how you make phosphorus from phosphate rock. Little complicated, but what the heck? I like complicated formulas like that. They're kind of interesting. So where do, you, where do we use phosphorus? Phosphorus is used, of course, in matches. Um, these are strike anywhere matches like this one here. These are, I can, that's a strike anywhere match right there. It has a little tip that has some red phosphorus in it. And if I strike this on something, the red phosphorus actually, if I can make enough friction, would turn into red phosphorus, uh, would turn into white phosphorus. The red phosphorus turns into white phosphorus, which then gets hot because it's in the air. And when it does that, uh, it then can light the red part of the match here, which actually is mostly sulfur and something to oxidize the sulfur, usually a chemical called potassium chlorate. And that reaction just happens pretty quick. And then that's it. Let's hope we don't set off the fire alarm. But I got permission to do this. Okay, hopefully we won't have to evacuate. Um, some really cool slow motion photography that I found online of, uh, this is using a special photo photographic system called a Schlierian optical system that can measure the changes in density of air. So really quite spectacular. Here you can see the phosphorus has already started the sulfur and the, and the potassium chlorate on fire there. There's talking about a little bit about the Schlierian system. This also is kind of the same way you see heat rising from, from cars on a hot day parallel rays of light get bent by the different, the hot and cool air differently. So you can see uh, here, it lets you actually see the hot and cold air and how it moves. It's really amazing optical system. He's actually gonna come in here and try to blow out the match. A character enters from the right. Okay, you can see the breath. You'll see his breath too. There it goes. Yeah, 10,000 frames per second. There it goes, that's 10,000 frames per second. Now the idea here to blow out a flame, what you're trying to do there is to cool it off enough that the combustion can't continue. Um, and if we continued here, you would see that he was not successful. The, the match will catch fire again, but I'm not gonna do that. Let's talk about safety matches. Safety matches are a little different. These are safety matches. They do, do not have phosphorus on the tip. These matches only have sulfur and uh, uh, potassium chlorate, the oxidizer and the fuel mixed together on the tip. The phosphorus is right here on this striking strip. But they also have not just phosphorus, but there's glass uh, there's ground up glass here, and there's ground up glass in here as well. So when you strike the match on the striker strip, you make heat, and you turn a little of the red phosphorus on the strip here into white phosphorus, and that's what gets the potassium chlorate and the sulfur burning there. Actually, I think I have that chemical formula. 
and it's allowing me to use a transition I never get to use. So there it is, okay. <laughs> so here you have the white phosphorus combining with oxygen to make uh, uh, either this molecule here or uh, phosphorus pentoxide, and that sets on fire the potassium chlorate, which produces a lot of oxygen, and that oxygen combines with the sulfur and gives you sulfur dioxide, which is that smell of the match you're probably now smelling, sulfur dioxide. It's kind of an eggy kind of smell. So where else is phosphorus used? Um, in weaponry, uh, it's a really vicious, awful weapon. And it was uh, first, I think, used in World War I, really, uh, in a, in a, in an extensive uh, amount. Phosphorus is a really nasty weapon. If you make a phosphorus bomb, the phosphorus liquefies, and it's flaming as it travels out. And if it lands on your skin, it sticks, and it's on fire, and it will not extinguish very easily. It's really not a very nice weapon to use. It's still used a little bit today. You're not supposed to use it against people. You're supposed to use it to make smoke now, but I think people, I think it's still being used against people. Here's a test firing of a uh, phosphorus bomb over a ship. This was um, uh, the USS Alabama uh, uh, during a test exercise in September of 1921. So um, I guess this is where they were still using it on people. But it, notice uh, what this, this thick white cloud it makes as well. So you can, use you can still use phosphorus legally to make clouds, but you're not supposed to use it against people. So moving inward now, again, away from warfare, thank you. Uh, where is it in your body? I mentioned it's quite a bit of your body. Well, it's actually in your bones and your teeth. Uh, it's hydroxyapatite, hydroxyapatite, sorry. And um, do you remember that uh, rock that they got phosphorus out of? It was, it was apatite. Well, it's a mineral similar to that. Calcium phosphate, this time with uh, OH on the end of it, uh, makes that. It's, I'm, I, I had to use this for teeth. I'm sorry. I looked up pictures of teeth online, and they're all really, really gross. So I thought I'd just use chattery teeth, OK? Um, by the way, you have Halloween coming up, so skeletons are going to be really important to us, so keep that in mind. Um, you're also going to find uh, phosphorus in every cell wall. It forms uh, this double layer of phosphorus. There's phosphorus compound in here and in here, and there's a double layer of called a phospholipid bilayer. And if we look closely at one of these little balls with the tails on it, um, it kind of looks like this. And right inside the head of there, notice there's a phosphorus atom. So without phosphorus, no cell walls. It makes life difficult. It's also in your DNA. And in the amino acids, uh, it's in the things that hold the amino acids into the DNA, and it's in, in the amino acids it's themselves. So here you can see they're all over the place in there. And one more important place in your body, without phosphorus, there would be no uh, ATP in your body. And the ATP is what gives the cells the energy to live. That's, that's, that's your gasoline right there. Uh, where else? Fertilizer. Fertilizer is kind of... Uh, important to us. Uh, here's, uh, this is also 10-10-10 fertilizer, I think. Yep, 10-10-10. These numbers here on the fertilizer tell you what's in the fertilizer. The first number tells you how much nitrogen there is. Plants need to fix nitrogen. Uh, the second number is how much phosphorus there is, and it's by percentage. And the third number is potassium. By the way, if there's anybody who needs some fertilizer, I am not taking this home on Muni. It smells like a barnyard. So if anybody would like this after, please take it. Um, we can use, it's also used in cleaning. Uh, trisodium phosphate uh, is a very good, but it's a heavy duty cleaner. They used to put this in detergents, in laundry detergents. The problem being that the phosphate gets washed down into the rivers and the ocean and the uh, algae can use that phosphate and you get algal blooms and it's very, very destructive to the uh, bodies of water. So it's no longer used in uh, detergents. As a matter of fact, my all detergent here, notice at the bottom there says, we don't use phosphorus. That's my second example of no phosphorus. My last example has to do with semiconductors. Now, if you were here last month for silicon, if you take a piece of silicon, the silicon atoms are bound together. All of the electrons in silicon are bound to all the other electrons in the other silicon atoms. And so if you try to, there's no free electrons here. So if you put a battery across it, no current would flow here because all of the electrons are bound up. 
They can't, there's no free electrons to allow the electricity to flow. However, if you'd like to make it conductive, you need something with not just four electrons on the outside, you need something with five electrons on the outside. So phosphorus, if you put a few phosphorus atoms in there, now you have free electrons. See them hanging out there? Not attached to anything. And now if you attach a battery to it, this is called an N-type semiconductor because you have one extra electron, negative extra electron, and you connect the battery to it. And guess what? This kind of, this is just like a one in a million, sil uh, uh, one in a million of those atoms are exchanged for phosphorus, and now you get current flow. Now it's no longer an insulator. Um, now this is very important because if you have semiconductors, there is, by the way, the N-type semiconductor, and there's also a P-type semiconductor, which has one fewer electron, um, uh, which you make with boron. Uh, and if you put them together, N-type, P-type, N-type, you now have something called a transistor. Uh, and so the current between the emitter and the collector, this is a very large current, can be controlled by a very small current right here at the base into this right here. So you can actually control large currents with a small current. We, it's an amplifier and it's responsible for all of our wonderful little appliances that we have now. So I have, that's about all I have for you now. Uh, thank you. We're going to now move right in and uh, start talking about a little bit about phosphorus outside the earth.